next week we are planning on doing lightning talks. The topic is still kind of being like sussed out, but um, I think we're probably going to do like developer stories. So basically like how did you become a developer and what are you doing now? Just to kind of um, get the community sharing what they're doing, what they're working on, where they've come from. So maybe to bring us a little closer together. Um, so if you're interested in giving one of those, uh, reach out to me or John or any of the organizers on the Chadev Slack. Um, and then the week after that is the UTC Symposium. So it's not a Chadev event, but we're encouraging everyone to go to the symposium. So it's supposed to be really cool. I think it's over at the, it may be at the library, but it's at the library. So yeah. Um, also, we need sponsors. So Code Science is doing this week, um, but we, we, we really need some sponsors. So if you or your company wants to sponsor us, get in touch again with any of the organizers. Um, and yeah, today we've got Bruce Tate coming with live, he's gonna live code, guys. This is gonna happen uh, on, on live view. Uh, so yeah, let's uh, give it up for Bruce. All right, so um, I, told, I told Anna and a few others that, um, that this feels a little bit like juggling chainsaws, which didn't say, oh, in the dark and driving. So um, I'm not sure how this is going to go, but we ought to have a lot of fun. This is a technology that's about a month old. It's called LiveView. And um, so a great story. The guy that's been working on it, is his name is Chris McCord. And he basically moved over to a new language about uh, five or six years ago and started working on this idea. And um, basically, he had to build a web server that would support it first. And then once he had that, he found that everything kind of came together in a hurry. And the best way to, the best way to put this is that you can build highly, highly interac interactive apps that scale really, really well without custom JavaScript. And it sounds too good to be true, and I'm going to try to show you why it's not. So um, even though this has only been out about a month, a bunch of little um, Twitter demos have been flying out. Like this one guy put two clocks side by side, one that was done with the traditional node stack and one that was done with live view, and you couldn't tell the difference. Then there was a guy who built a, um, a front end for a tool called Observer, which is a, um, a performance management tool with, that's highly updated um, for distributed systems. There was a guy that built a real-time chat application, no custom JavaScript. A guy did Flappy Bird, if you guys played that before. And this is all server-side rendered. There's a guy that did pagination and sorting. So these are the typical things that you say, no way, right? You can't do server-side rendering for these kinds of problems, right? And this is a regular express render, 30 lines of code. So I know this sounds a little, little uh, too good to be true, so I thought that maybe I'd show you what's happening here. I don't know what the, fl the flicker is. Um, we're just going to have to deal with it. I've got enough problems on my plate here. So this is how it works. It's complicated. There's a function. There's state. You update the state, and the function builds a web page. You know, I know that's complicated, right? The cool thing is that you can change your, your, the state in your application. It can use whatever tools your application uses today, whatever comes in from the browser and whatever comes in from your app. And we're going to do both today. I'm not going to code things like database backends or you know, uh, Twitter APIs. We already know our languages can do those things. I'm going to show you how the events get from the client to the server um, and how, the, how that stuff basically works. Um, but we're not here at the Daytona to see um, you know, clean driving. We want to see the crashes. So um, let's, let's get straight to the demo. Um, so the rest of this talk is just doing some stuff in live view. Um, I want to point out that everything that you see can be found at, at um, just a few minutes after the talk. I'll push it up to GitHub. Um, this is the Groxio learning site. And this is basically a copy of the Phoenix live view examples. Um, so that's the foundation that we're going to be starting from. Okay. So, I'm a little scared. You could tell that I was stalling a little bit. 
Um, okay, so the only things that I really have to do to establish this piece of code is a live view. I've already coded a little bit of the application, but it's just the raw HTML. And you can see this thing is called a sigil. Live view has a special sigil, which means that it's going to take the strings and make some substitution. And one of the things that it's going to look for is everywhere that we have a template entry, it's going to say, hey, let's make an entry. And when that particular template entry changes, then we'll send down to the client. Right? So that's how it works. So, um, so let's go ahead and see how that works. Oh, well, the other, so the only other change that we had to make for this particular demo is I said, call this link. The link goes to a route, right? And then, so in the router, I built a custom route. So that's the only code that I haven't shown you. Um, everything else is going to happen live today. So let's go ahead and start up a server. Right. We can run some of these demos, right? So now I should be able to take my browser and point it to localhost um, 4000. And I'm not going to show you all these demos, but we are going to show a few of them. Oh, there's a bug. How did I get just this far without... With Okay, what do we have happening here? Okay. Fail connect. Okay, so. Oh. Let's try starting it from scratch. That's going to be the first of many problems that we're going to see today. All right. So now we're going to start this out. Uh, do I need to be on the internet? Surely not. Okay, there we go. Oh, I see. Yeah. So um, on the live view, there's a there's this um, Austin weather piece um, that's kind of uh, being pulled over on the server side. But I want to show you a couple of the um, of the demos, right? Like um, here's a particularly exciting one. It's a counter, right? So I can count up, I can count down, I can cross an exception, and it'll start in the last known good state. Let's see something a little bit less exciting, like this snake game, right? Right, and this is server-side rendered. So that's getting longer. Boom, right? So um, there were a few of them like this. Um, and you find that if you're sending down the bare minimum, only the things that change, then this demo can be highly interactive without moving very much data at all. Like we, could, we can change the refresh rate for the Pac-Man, make it smaller, make this guy come back up, or we can make the refresh rate faster, right? And it's snappy, just as if it was rendered right here. So, but that's not what you came to see. We're here to see Bruce Tate crash. So let's write some live code. Okay, so the way that this works is I have this HTML, and this HTML takes this thing, uh, this HTML takes this thing called a signs. And this is just a map, key value pairs, right? So we can put some things in the map. Here's where we initially things up, start things off, right? So I'm going to take the socket and I'm going to pipe that through a function called assign and I'll pass it a key value pair. There you go, right? And now all we have to do is drop in some dynamic content, right? And I'm going to type in, right, for the assigns for hello, right? And so when I save this guy, then I should see the world. And we're just going to do this over and over. It's going to be a really boring demo. Right? <laughs> so let's go ahead and create an application multiprocess message. Like maybe we'll take an application that will send a tick every second. Let's do that. So um, now we need to, of course, the first thing that we need to do 
is extend our model to have something to work with, right? So we'll have a clock, and we'll put an initial value of our clock at zero. And then, of course, we have to, in our table, we have to write this guy out. So what goes here? Clock. And so um, I'm actually not doing anything with the clock yet. We'll fix that in a second. Um, so here, and there's the clock. So it's updating. We're on the right track. But let's go ahead and look at the clock demo. So they had to spin up a clock. Sure enough, here's one. So you see timer. The colon timer means that we're calling Erlang, which is the language that Elixir is based on. It says every, every full second, send a message to ourself called tick. And this will create another process to send messages every second. So let's go back to the table. And let's drop this code in there. So now we have an inbound message. Now we just have to process it. So there's two types of handles that we'll use. Handle info comes from our applications. Handle event comes from other pieces, uh, comes from the browser. So the, um, our message is going to be called tick, right? That's the thing that we sent right here. And so I'm also going to get a socket. And what's a socket? It's key value pairs, right? So, and I'm going to send back. I don't need to send a reply back, but I do need to set the state. So I'm going to say no reply. And I'm going to set the, set the whole state to assign. Or I'm going to just call a function. Increment, and I'm going to take the socket. And I'm going to pass it the thing that we want to increment. And now we're just going to write another function. What was our function called? Uh, inc. Couldn't remember that. I'm in trouble today. So we're going to take the socket. And we're going to take the field. And we're going to do an update. Which field? This one. So for, for the one that we just wrote, that's going to be clock, right? And now I'm going to write a little function. This and says, here's a function. I want to take the first argument, and one, and just add one to it. And so now I ought to be able to drop in for my counter. So this is, so there's one. And here's another one. Let's just do this. So that's one, and that's two. So now, all I have to do is tweak the links a little bit. So I ought to be able to say phx dot, uh, what is it, phoenix click. So the first one, so the first message, this guy right here, this is the message that, I wanna, uh, that I'm going to get. Um, and we're not processing a message here. But when we do, we're going to call it count. And then I'm going to, on the top one, I'm gonna, I want to pass the data counter one. And on the bottom one, I want to pass the data counter two. And now all I have to do is code the function to process those counters. And since this is coming from the browser, that's a handle event. And I'm, what was our message called? Does anybody remember? Yeah. And then we, we're going to take uh, um, some type of field. And it also gets a socket. And the socket, again, is key value pairs. And I'm, all we're going to do is send a no reply. And then we're going to send inc of socket and then my field, and let's see if that works. I'm going to keep clicking on that guy. Uh, so what? We're blowing up. The expression is incomplete on line. Okay. Live render. Okay, five.
Oh, the counters. Okay. Yeah. Line 30. Perfect. Uh, there we go. Oh, uh, there it is. Yep. Count one. No, so this is clock, right? And this is counter one. And that's counter two. Okay, excellent. It's, it looks like autocomplete hit me. So let's see what happens here. Uh, so we're getting an argument error. Okay, I see what's happening. Counter one is not available. So what do you think that means? Yeah, we haven't set it up yet. So um, let's take this guy and grab a couple of those. Okay, there's counter one and counter two. And now we ought to be able to see the counters there, right? If I click a counter, okay, that blew up. And I happen to know why this one blew up. So in this case, we're, we're trying to send a message we're trying to send a message for counter one, right? But it's not, a, it's not a string, it's an atom. So all we have to do, this is just a function, right? So we say string dot two atom field. And now if I click counter one, if I click counter two, I'm ready, right? So you can see if you're used to user interface programming with JavaScript, we're not coding any extra routes. We're not doing any JavaScript. My cycle time is everything that lives on the server. That's, that's where my headspace can stay. I'm coding a state, and I'm coding events that are coming in, and then I'm just, I'm, I'm, um, I'm changing my function, and I'm changing the state, and that's it. That's live view, right? So one of the things that's cool is that I'm not limited just to clicks and user input, I can also grab things like key presses if I register for one. Like, wouldn't it be cool to tie counter one to the one key and counter two to the two key? It's pretty easy to do. So let's go um, back here and let's say Phoenix key up, press, and I need to set, since I don't want it to happen just when I'm this in this particular div, um, I need to set a target. I want to say it's going to work on the whole window. Right? So then all I have to do is create an event for press. This one is for press. So uh, say again. Sorry, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Pair programming, real time here. Okay, and so now we want to call the, this is the key, or the character. And so now we want to call a different function here, right? Let's call it press, and let's pass it the character. And so for, for those of you who don't know any Elixir, I want to show you a cool trick called pattern matching. Okay, so we're, we need to pass, we need to pass also a socket. And a socket. And this is going to blow up because it's unclear. Now it won't blow up. OK, so now I'm, I'm calling a function called press. And um, I'm going to get the socket, which is the key value pair, and also a character. So the cool thing, the cool game that I can play with Elixir, so I could say if I get a socket, and if I get a 1, that's just a, a straight, that's called a pattern match. I can say increment. We already know what to do here, right? Um, increment takes a socket. We have one of those. And a field. So I just want to increment counter one. And similarly, if I press two, I want to increment counter two. And if I press anything else, um, I just want to return the socket. Okay, and so now if I go over here, say again. Oh, thank you. Oh. 
Okay, thank you. And that will blow me up twice. Pair programming real time. I love it. Okay. So line 85. Yep, thank you. That won't even compile. Okay, so now let's go back over to here. So now I should be able to type one. Look at that. And two. So now we're binding individual key presses to, to, the, to the counter. Uh, so you're starting to see how everything is just a function. And you can get, and when you look at super interact, interactive applications, it's not always about moving more data. You can get pretty, pretty dramatic effects based on a small number of things changing on the client. Here's what I mean. So let's say we have this, this, um, this variable. What's this thing called? Clock, right? So let's take that and let's use that in the worst way from a user interface perspective imaginable. See that? Right? Yeah. So that's not horrendous enough, right? So let's make it worse. That needs to go faster, right? Um, and it should be pretty easy to do. All we have to do is find our mount. This is the increment. Ah, let's go for it, right? <laughs> What's cool is how smooth this looks, right? The data is, it's basically limited by the speed of your connection. And there's not a lot of data that's moving here. So let's play with this again. Let's push this out a little bit. Let's make that every two seconds. And then let's look at, at the data that's going back and forth, right? So I'm going to inspect this guy. Oh, man, that's horrible. Um, you might have to get up a little bit closer. It's OK. So I'm going to click on the second WebSocket. And look at what's coming down. This is all the data that's coming down. Basically, an authenticity, um, authenticity code, so I can't have um, certain kinds of web attacks. And basically, in here, all we have is my counters coming down, um, and if I press, and if I press some keys, those come down exactly when I need them. You have exactly the amount of data that you need to send, exactly when you need it. It's dramatic, right? And so let's fix this monstrosity for a little bit. Let's go back to zero degrees. degrees and we're okay here and let's look at some of the other types of, of input that we can pull like there's a search form here and so to get autocomplete you basically need character by character to send the, to send the data up to the client and normally we do the, these with with quick kind of polls and things like that but um, in this case all we're going to do is make a tweak on the client and ask for the um, and ask for the 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 data every time it changes. An autocomplete, maybe it's a suggest, right? So I'm going to take this and I'm going to build another event here. This is suggest. And I'm going to get some text, but I'm going to do an, another elixir trick. I'm going to do a pattern match. Anybody notice what the field name is that we're checking? guy right here, right? It's this input control, this guy right here. So in the pattern match, I'm going to grab the data associated with Q, right? And now I can use the Q in this function, and this is just an assign, right? I could say assign. A socket, and what are we going to assign? We're basically going to uh, let's call it type. Whatever you've typed, and we're going to send down Q. And so now all we have to do is drop this into our form. But of course, we're calling um, assign. We could call any function that we wanted as long as it updated um, and assigned um, the, the, the context, right? That, that socket. And the cool thing is that I could, be, I could be doing any kind of population that I wanted to as long as I was happy with the performance. 
and since it's an elixir, that could live in a separate process without penalty. Okay, E-L, uh, E-T-B, okay. So, and I wanna type type here. So, let's go back over here. Oh, what's break broken? Oh, we didn't set the property. So, we know how to do that. All right. So, um, now I can update this and I see there's nothing in here, but as I type, comes down exactly as I expect it to. And I can play the same type of game to grab the submitted data. It works exactly the same. So we're going to go down to suggest. We're going to do something that looks almost exactly like that, but this time we're going to grab Phoenix Submit. We're going to get a submit event. And again, all this is going to do is allow us to do a function over socket, right? So I'm going to grab the same data in the same way, and this time I'm going to type search. This could, this could be is something as, um, as easy as go to the database and grab this data, right? So let's say... Did I have a, did I pass a term? Socket, uh, I don't need this guy, right? And let's say, and what we want to do is, so, but we want to assign that, right? So socket, we want to do a um, assign, and I'm going to assign search to this guy right here. And then we have to um, set this up. First time we've remembered that, right? So that's good. And then we need to also drop it in the form. So all we need to do is drop this guy in here. So now I bet that I can take, take this guy. Is anybody expecting it to spin and start to lean over a little bit? So I'm searching for the word search. Um, and I haven't gotten the submit event, so let's see what's wrong. What's that? Say again. Oh, uh, I see. So mount, I, I assigned search to dash dash, so that's correct. So um, I have my search function so my uh, function is going to return the assign plus whatever term that I, and I'm going to assign the search atom to whatever this was set to. But we can inspect that. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to look at our, um, basically at the output, and we're going to say, right, and here, we got that, so we're, we're getting that data correctly. Oh, it did work, okay. Fixed it! <laughs> live fixing, live coding, live view. All right. So the last piece of, the last little thing that I'd like to do um, before we get to questions, should we, should we work with focus and blur, or are, we, are you guys um, more hungry for questions? Who says more live coding? Who says questions? Okay, so more live coding, and then I'll stay over after a little bit for questions. Um, okay, so um, let's say, let's hide this table every time that we get a, um, every time that this is selected, right? Just to, just to kind of prove the idea that we can move things around um, as, as events happen on the page. 
So um, in this case, we're going to handle event focus. And that's going to take um, whatever window that's happening on. We don't really care about that, so we'll ignore it. And um, I'm basically just going to do an assign in here. So I'll grab something that looks like that. But this time I'm going to assign focus and I'm going to assign it to true, right? And I'll do a similar one for blur. And that I'm gonna set this to false. So now we have to, this is the second time I've remembered. We're on a roll. So it's probably not gonna be focused when we start the page. Um, so now we can actually drop, also drop it in here just to prove that we're working. So let's see if we're getting any luck here. Oh, by the way, if you're watching Chris McCord, thank you for fixing this bug the day before the demo. <laughs> it was awesome. Okay, so, oh, we never captured the event, right? So I'm clicking in here, I'm clicking out. We're not getting event because we never asked to capture it. So we're going to put the focus and blur on this input field. And it's exactly what you think it would be. It's Phoenix focus. And that, then whatever we call the event, and I think that we call them focus and blur, right? Okay, let's see if it likes that better. So I'm gonna go in here. Ah, look at that. Okay, so now all we have to do is hide the table whenever we are true, right? So let's drop in a function called hide. Hide takes true, and let's pass back a style, All right? And we're going to do the same thing. So if we get a false, the way to read this is Elixir is going to call the first function head that matches the arguments. So if it gets a head, it'll do this work. If it gets a um, if it gets a true, there, it'll return that. If it's false it will return nothing. I'm glad I, I stopped to explain that. <laughs> okay, so um, now we're going to go down to, to the table and we're going to drop in, what do we call our function? Right, and then I'll pass it focus, I think, right? So now if we go in here, oh, so, oh, look at that. CSS error. Oh, what happened? Table. Oh, I hit the <laughs> I hit the link up there. Okay, so now, yep, and off. That's it. So let me point out a couple of things before I take questions. I know you're at, you're anxious to ask them. Um, in Chattanooga, it's a pretty exciting time for Maggie and I. Maggie, raise your hand. So we're starting a business, um, and one of the things that we'd like to do is mentoring. And so we have a mentoring sessions for women and minority programmers. So if you want to be a mentor, then um, then come on and um, come on and show up. Um, it's at the Agnes. Um, it's it's at the fifth floor, right down there at six o'clock every Thursday. I think that we've missed maybe a handful of times. So uh, Ellie, Anna have come. Um, uh, Grace has come, and um, so it's a great, exciting time. So the second thing is that we run a conference here called Gig City Elixir, and the creator of Live View should be here. No promises, but um, I think that that Chris is going to be here. Um, the the third thing is um, number two on the chart here. We have a Live View course. It's the first one of its kind. It's just six hundred bucks a day which is about half of what we would normally charge for it. Um, and remember, if you're a startup, then this is transformational. This, this can really, the productivity numbers that are coming out of this are, um, what, people are three and four times as productive at doing these kinds of applications. 
Um, and it scales up to big teams uh, even better. So in the last piece I heard, um, Anna mentioned um, that, that she's looking for sponsorships for, for ChadDrev. Um, we're also looking for sponsors for Gig City Elixir. It's a huge undertaking. It's something that we can't do by ourselves. Um, we're trying to keep the prices low for individual developers. If your company wants to be involved with, it, uh, involved with it, we would love to have you come along our side. And if you'd like, you can, you can sponsor. We try to give away 15 tickets a year to, uh, to people that are underrepresented in the programming field. So with that, I will take questions on Phoenix Live View. I will. I will. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so basically the question is that we had this, this string with a, a live view sigil. So one of the things that you didn't see is um, if things get more complicated, since, th since this is functional programming, those are just functions, those are strings. So we have all the weight of the Phoenix framework that can create HTML tags and links and things like that. You could, you could take straight strings and drop them in there. The only thing that you have to do is where you have that template, it's going to register the initial value that went in and whether it's changed or not. Right? So um, if you pass in a hash and I pass in the whole assigned, well, then it's always going to live update the page, any, uh, the whole page, anytime anything changes. Right. But I can, I can write a tiny function that says update this piece, right? And I can pass in only the counter. And if I do that, like everywhere you, you saw, every function that I called in my code, um, I passed a single at, um, and that's kind of shorthand for one of those assigns. So effectively, you get change, it sends down only the exact bit of data that it needs to send down, and it sends it exactly when it needs it. It's, it's really just, just stunningly beautiful. And it's a function, right? So it's a string, you can drop in strings in the middle of that string, it's awesome. Yeah. Showing it high. Yeah, so this is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, I went through that really quickly. Let me show you what's happening. So um, actually, there were three function heads. The way, uh, yeah, I'm sorry, there are two function heads here. We played the same game in the press, right? So there are three function heads that look the same. So the way that Elixir tells which one to invoke is um, the first step is it looks at the number of arguments. If the number of arguments is different, it's a different function. The second thing it does is it goes down and it'll try to match the arguments, right? So in this case, we passed in a tr if we passed in a true, it'll say true, true, those match, then um, we'll get that display none. And if I pass in a false, it will skip the first function head and pick up the second one and render an empty string. Yes. So the statement is that often this would be handled with a switch or a case or something like that. Uh, I believe, so you do have switches and cases uh, or versions of that in Elixir. I believe in keeping the left margin as skinny as possible. And if I can do that, it's easier for me to test things and it's easier for me to try things out as I go. But, um, but you can code, definitely, you can definitely code both ways. So where this comes in, in, in handy is if I'm trying to do something like that you would do in object-oriented programming with a dispatch, Maybe you have a type atom, and the type um, I can match for dog, and when I call speak and it matches dog, it says woof. If I call speak and it matches cat, it says meow. If I call speak and it matches other, then you get to pick what noise your animal makes. Yeah. 
Okay, so the question is, on the events, are they predefined? So yes and no, right? So live view has a set of core HTML events. You can open up more by cutting, coding custom JavaScript, and it's, it's very easy to do. Um, the second piece is that, remember, the very first event that I coded was um, an Erlang timer. And Erlang doesn't know anything about live view. That timer code hasn't changed in probably, probably 20 years. Um, so, so we pulled that out um, and integrated with that just like it was a native piece. So basically, I can do inter-process communication to any other, any other Elixir system, and it works um, fine. Um, and, and so it's this point that, remember when I had this, um, this page at the top of the presentation where I said, um, where I said you had two types of events? The application events are from processes, and they're called OTP events. And when you hear multiple processes, don't be afraid. So the, the reason that this works and is scalable is that Elixir has, has processes based on Erlang processes. They're green threads. And where you might get um, 40 or 50,000 uh, threads comfortably out of something like Java, you can get into the millions in Elixir. It's, they're, they're very lightweight. They're very efficient. Um, and, and this is kind of the way um, when I have, when I have uh, separate uh, big units of my application is a great way to carve things up. Can I show the source? Uh, uh, I'm going to let you do that. I'm going to let you pull down the code. I don't want to. I don't want to go uh, on the browser. I'm going to let you go ahead and pull that down yourself. I don't want to get into those details in this setting. But that's a that's a good question. It will scale very, very well, yes. Okay. So it's almost, so if you think about an application um, that you would code that behaves like this from scratch, you can see that you would have to open up the routes and you would have to send the same, the same types of, of bits of data that I'm, I'm sending right now, right? Um, you know, the difference is things like, um, you know, clock ticks and things like that. But um, Elixir is already, you know, you know, several dozen times faster than than um, than web servers and things like Ruby. Anyway, it has speed to burn. It has concurrency to burn. So this so far has been very very scalable. Great questions. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. So, so the statement is that when I make changes to the code, it basically what you're seeing is something called OTP. And OTP has what's called a supervision tree. So it recycles that, which means that um, if you had a database connection and you were doing development, you probably want some of that to be recycled. Uh, minimally, you can set the policies for what gets recycled when. So that's exactly what I, I would do if I wanted to, if I wanted something that was long running and I didn't want to restart as part of my watcher. And actually it's what I do um, when I'm working on an application. So I have a, um, a language learning program that I'm not ready to release yet, but I basically go through the pages of a lesson and rather than say, hey, if you read two plus two, you're gonna see four. I could say, type in two plus two. And they could either type in five and I could say, you're wrong. Um, or they could type in four, and I could say hooray, or they could say delete all your files. <laughs> and that's the one I'm working on right now. But, um, but basically, that piece is called an OTP server. It doesn't mean it's on a different system, it's in a different process. And I can define the policy for when that gets reset. But that's a great question. Remind me your name. Uh, Weston? Wesley. Wesley, that's a great question. More? That's it. So juggling chainsaws. All right. Take care.